Hey, if you guys would, a little housekeeping thing, do me a favor. Slide in. If you have some room, slide in. We've got some guys standing up that need a seat. There's some up here in the front. Spitting distance, I call it. And some over here on the right-hand side, if you guys need to find a seat. It's a good problem to have, isn't it? It's a great problem to have. Hey, um, I'm glad we sang the last part, or that first song again there at the end. That beginning to end my life in your hands. Anybody in here just want to shout when you sing that? Amen. Thinking back on your life and from the beginning of it to the end of it, it was in his hands. You know, um, and the truth of that line, you never let go. Um, even when I do, even when we do. You hold me, the one thing I know is you're not letting go of me. Doesn't that make you feel secure? Make you feel good to know that it's not your performance, it's not what you say or do, it's him holding you? Yeah. Hey, if you have your Bibles with you, by the way, I'm Pastor Jeremy, if we haven't met yet. I'm one of the lead pastors here. They let me preach every now and then. And uh, today's one of those days. So, hey, Acts chapter 2 Verses 42 through 47 is where we're going to uh, begin. It's where we've been the entire month of January. We're going to finish here um, just explaining some things. But if you're physically able to stand for the reading of the word, I'm going to ask that you will. Uh, with us, Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together. And they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any who had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that we get to call you Father. That we get to be your little boys and your little girls. And Lord, we pray, I pray for all of us in this room that uh, we wouldn't get too much further past that in our lives with you, to have childlikeness in our faith and to believe on your son Jesus and that through him we belong to you. And looking back on the landscapes of our lives, Lord, knowing and trusting and believing and seeing how you have held us how you have loved us, how you have accepted us, how we really do belong to you. And I pray, God, that with that knowledge, with that understanding, with that truth, that through Christ we belong to you, our lives would be changed and altered and that this world would be turned upside down through us. Yes, even us in this room. Today, now, and when we leave here, God, I pray that you would grant to me the gifts of preaching and teaching. Those are heavenly spiritual gifts that I do not possess that I need you to give to me so that your name would be made great, so that souls would be awakened, so that people would be saved. We love you, Lord. I pray for the fame of your son Jesus in this room. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to focus uh, in, in, in this Acts passage, I want to focus on the they's. Can I say that? Can I have that poor grammar? <laughs> We're going to look at the they's um, that are in this. It says they, so who are they? Now, when, um, um, when, when you look at this, the they's are, are the church, what we would call the church. Um, and I know that might sound strange but because um, many times... We refer to the church as a building, but when you look in the New Testament, the church was never referred to as a building. When it was talking about the church, it was talking about a people, not a place. 
you know. But y'all know as well as I do that we use language that says, hey, y'all, our kids, get in the, get in the car. We're going to go to the church. Or, hey, you want to go to church today? Or, you know, in, in, in UC, we say, hey, meet me down there at the church uh, across from the high school, and we'll go to Shelby together, right? We say stuff like that because we, and when we use language like that, and I know it might be weird for us to look at the kids and say, hey, get in the car. We're going to go to the place where the church meets, but that would be accurate. It would be the best way to say that. And maybe if we change our language and our thinking about what church is and who we are, it might change about the way, the way we view ourselves, uh, change what we do together collectively in this building. Now, look, the, 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 the Greek word, now, look, when, us, when, when preachers or Bible teachers say Greek, we're not trying to be fancy on you or anything. What happens is, is the, the, the New Testament was written in the Greek language. And so for us to understand and to help uh, you guys understand the, the, the real meaning of something, sometimes you have to go back to that original language that it was written in, and especially for this, okay? So the original word in Greek for church in the New Testament is the word ekklesia. Now, the word ekklesia is an ordinary Greek word. It wasn't a word that was a special word that was made up just to describe the church. It was used for anything, and the word means this. It means gathering. It means assembly of people who were called there, okay? So um, uh, uh, that, that's all the word means. Is it's, it's a group of people that are gathered or assembled together that were called to a meeting. And so look, if you can imagine with me in the first century, someone would look over and they would see a group of people over there. I'll say it again, Ernie, just for you. Uh, they, would, they would see a group of people that were over there and they would say, hey, that's an ecclesia. Okay, why are they there? Um, or who called them over there? What's that ecclesia? What's that assembly? What's that gathering? What's that meeting about? Who called them there? And so, look, there was no real identifying markers, you know. There were no made room shirts, right? There's no little fish stickers on the back of their car or crosses on their, um, uh, you know, ne- or, or, um, um, crosses for necklaces to say, oh, that's those guys. So how did they identify, you know, these groups as being churches? How did they identify them as being Christian meetings or gatherings? And so look, early on in Christian identity, look, from the passage I read in Acts chapter 2, it takes 12 years 12 more chapters, because in Acts, it's kind of like a, a, a chapter a year. By the way, plug, didn't do this in the first service, but um, um, starting uh, Wednesday night, the 14th of February, we're going to start doing an Acts study at, cha- at, at our UC campus. So come be a part of that grow group and um, join in there, and we're going to be doing Acts in several um, segments and several semesters. But if you want to come and learn more about what happens there, come on up there for that, okay? So anyways, in Acts chapter 2, it takes 12 years for them to be called Christians, Right? In Acts chapter um, 17, I mean, I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, it says the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So they get this little, look, and by the way, when they're called Christians, it's a derogatory term. It's little Jesuses, if I can say it that way, a little Christ. Wouldn't that be a good thing for us to be called? Oh, that's a little Christ over there. There's little people over there. That's what they are. But that's what, it was a derogatory term. But before that, okay, before those 12 years, they were called, oh, that group of people over there, are, those are those Nazarenes. Those are those people, those people over there at that gathering. They are those people of the way. Or they would say, those people over there, those are those disciples of that guy, Jesus. So that's how they were known. So look, ecclesias got their name, gatherings, assemblies got their name from the person that called them to the meeting. They got their names from the people that they belonged to, the people that called them out. In fact, um, if you look, in, it takes the 5th century uh, Turkish believers um, had a word for their gatherings called the Kriakos uh, Oikos. Okay, that meant belonging to the Lord. It gets changed in German to Kirch, that we translate into church. So it was literally, that assembly is the people who belong to the Lord Jesus. Wouldn't that be neat to be known as that? Right? Those people in that room today are a bunch of people who belong to Jesus. That would be a great thing for us to be called. For the world to see and for us to believe in this room that that's what we are. 
That's why we gathered here today. That's why we gathered here today. Jesus called you out on a really cold morning. You guys should get like a gold star for this. I'm going to tell you what. It was eight degrees at my house in Kayser this morning. If I wasn't preaching, I'd be watching this at home. Okay? <laughs> it's cold. But wouldn't that be great? That we would be called, hey, those people, why did you come here today? Jesus called me to this meeting. Jesus called me to gather. Jesus called me. He said, hey, you, get up. Come on. Go over there with the church. Those other people that belong to the world, belong to the Lord. So look, here's, let's jump in this. Acts chapter 2, who are the they's that are in Acts chapter 2? Luke, the writer of Acts, lists them for you. He gives you names. So let's go back here in Acts chapter 1, verse 13 through 15. They went up to the upper room where they were staying. By the way, Jesus had told them to gather there too before he had um, 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 ascended. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these were with one accord. Now pause with me. Did you guys know that the early church was so united they drove the same car? So, I was going to say, someone's going to get that in a little bit. <laughs> it's going to be delayed, you know. His <laughs> wife's going to hit him. And I, yeah, they drove one accord. They drove one car. I've been waiting for weeks to do that, Hugh. <laughs> Hugh did not think that was very funny. It was a softball, though. It's right there and with one accord anyway. Here we go. Let's move on. Peter, James, and John, all these guys are there. Um, and, and they were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women. Okay, there's more there. Um, um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Jesus' his brothers, his, 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 his actual brothers were there. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers and the company. Person. So it's about 120 people that are the they's that are there. And look, right away, I want you to look at something about the they's here. They're not a very impressive group. There's no kings in this group. There's no high-ranking officials in this group, there's no particularly wealthy people in this group yet, by the way, on all of those. Yet, there's going to be, right? The church is going to grow and explode. But look at this group, this ragtag group. Peter. It mentions Peter here. Peter, this is a guy who denied Jesus to his face just to save his own skin. He denies him. Thomas and Jesus, his brothers. It's Jesus' actual brother. What would it, it um, They doubted him. Jesus' own brothers, James writes about it and says that we doubted that he was Jesus. Thomas walks with Jesus for three years and doesn't believe fully until Jesus, after the resurrection, says, Hey, man, put your hands right here in the holes of my hands. Put your hand in the hole in my side. I am really alive. I'm really God in flesh. They doubt, they, they, they were all, by the way, all of the disciples, save, save one, John, deserted Jesus when they came to arrest him. They leave, they flee in the Garden of Gethsemane, and they're not even there at the cross. So we see, look, and, and what's amazing about this group of people that deny him, that doubt him, and that desert him, all of these days are going to be the people that are going to turn the world upside down. Acts chapter 17 says it. These men, talking about the disciples and the apostles, who have turned the world upside down have come here also. So what's the difference, guys? What made the difference in these people who deny, doubt, and desert him? It's the resurrection. Watch this, Acts chapter 1, verse 3. He, Jesus, presented himself alive to them after his sufferings by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. What made the difference? The resurrection. This guy who said, kill me, and in three days later, I will raise myself from the dead. Destroy this temple, right? He tells them. And they do. And in three days later, he's standing in front of them. There's a no doubter. For these men, they believe in Jesus because he rose from the dead. He proved who he was. Many proofs. He proved who he was by raise, raising himself from the dead. There is no doubt about it that this guy is with us. There's no doubt about it that this guy is God in flesh. He's standing here. We saw him die. He, he was dead. They put him in a tomb. And he is standing in front of us, speaking with us. He's standing in front of us, eating with us, encouraging us, cheering us on, caring for us, commissioning us. It's the resurrection. By the way, when you read through Acts, you'll find out 
that it says many of the priests were believing in Jesus. Now, here's what that, look, the priests that are believing in Jesus, many believe, scholars, myself included. See, I'm looking myself in the scholarly realm there, Donald. You like, you like that, didn't you, Donald? Anyway, um, these priests are the members of the Sanhedrin. These are the very people that tried Jesus because he said he was God. They said, that's blasphemy. You can't say that. And they, ha- they try him and they kill him. They put him on a cross. They have him executed. And they're standing there. And it says that many of them came to faith. What would it be that would cause them to come to faith? He's alive. The dude's standing in front of them. And it's a, oh my goodness, right there he stands. He really was who he said he was. He was God. Don't ever under- underestimate the power of the resurrection in the life of a believer. Not only in theirs, but in yours too. Right? We have all had those encounters of a rise, of, of a risen, live Jesus. Right? I love that Nicole C. Mullins song, song that she used to sing years ago, the, the, My Redeemer Lives. And she says, how do you know? Because I spoke with him this morning. I know he lives because right over there just a few minutes ago, right when we were worshiping, he shows up in my heart and speaks to me. Right? Never underestimate the power of the resurrection. Right? It's powerful. And that's what changes these guys. That's what, look, they may have denied him. They may have doubted him, and they knew it. They deserted him. But they knew that he didn't deny them, that he didn't doubt them, and he didn't desert them. Because of all of the people, all of the people to come to, he comes back to them. Peter, I know you denied me, but feed my sheep. I love you. You know that I love you, right? Peter says, and he says, I know. Feed my sheep. Of all the people to come back to, Thomas, I know you doubted me. Put your hands here. Put your hands there and go. Right? It's those very people. And I don't know about you guys, but that means a lot to somebody who's denied him, deserted him, and doubted him. You know? Denied to his face that I even knew him. Doubt still to this day at times. Right? Right? And he still comes to me and says, go feed my sheep. I still love you. Now, they knew this, and I want you to know this. They belonged to Jesus. They knew they belonged to him. He had bought them with the price. They belonged to him. Now, look, when I say they belonged to Jesus, now, many of you in the room, look, when you hear the word belong, you cannot use, we cannot use our um, 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 worldly, our, our own understanding, a human understanding of the word belong because our understanding of belong is tainted. Our understanding of belong is, is, is distorted in many ways, okay? Because, look, when, when I say you belong, okay, or, or if I would ask you, I asked the staff the other day, um, some of the guys in the staff, I have my baseball bat. And I, if I'm in the office and I have my baseball bat, I'm doing sermon prep. And I'm walking around thinking because I think better with my bat. Anybody ever saw the movie A Few Good Men? Okay, and Tom Cruise says, I think better with my bat. Got that from him, stole it, and I do it. But I do think better with my bat. And plus, when I come in and ask the staff stuff, they know they need to answer, I'm going to hit them with it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I come in and I said, hey, guys, I said, tell me about something, tell me about something that belongs to you. Tell me about something that belongs to you. And so they started spitting off these things. My phone. Belongs to me, my car, my, my, my clothing. Matt said Regina. Regina, you need to hear that. I'm just kidding. Matt didn't say that. <laughs> but they started mentioning belongings. Did you hear that? There is a difference between belongings and belonging. A huge difference. A world of difference. An eternal difference between belongings and belonging. Because you know as well as I do, that car, you might say it belongs to me. It's a part of me, right? But crack the screen, right? Or let the, 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 the speaker stop working, which my, my speaker doesn't work right now, so everybody sounds like Charlie Brown when they're talking to me. Speaker doesn't work, or if it won't take an update, and you will get rid of that phone for a new one in a skinny minute, won't you? Right? Or if that car won't crank on a... On, <laughs> Ernie, sorry. Yeah. Uh, if your truck won't crank on an eight-degree morning, Right? You'll get as much as you love it and as much as that car belongs to me. You'll get rid of it in a skinny minute if it won't crank anymore, okay? Or if, you know, those clothes go out of style or if they just don't fit anymore, you're going to get new ones. So, that, look, they didn't belong to you, did they? That's not belonging. They weren't a part of you. They weren't something that were you. Or the other sense of the word belonging that we have is that, okay, I fit in. Those are my people, right? 
I belong with them. Those kind of people, those are my people, or that group's my group. So we have belonging of, of stuff like we're a part of, we're a member of, we fit into, we're the, um, that, that's a social club that I'm in, right? I'm in this club or, or that group of friends. But let me tell you something. You stop paying your dues, how long will you be in that social club, right? You stop going to the meetings, how long are you going to be in that club, right? Or that group of people that are my people, you know, disagree with them. Tell them you're thinking about something else. They'll drop you like a bad habit, right? Or, you know, th that boyfriend that tells you we belong together. Tell him no to sex. See how long you belong. Right? Belonging in our sense has stipulations. Belonging in our sense is based on behavior, conformity. It's based on appearances. It's based on performance. It's conditional. Right? And so we have a choice. We have a choice to make. Is what do we do? When we see that we don't belong there anymore, okay, do we keep pretending? Do we keep faking it to fit in? Do we keep performing to try to please? Do we keep trying to conform so that we can maintain a fake sense of belonging in our lives? Right? Or are we just vulnerable enough to say, you know what? This is who I am. This is who I am. Hey, um, you know, it's not true belonging if someone says, I love and accept you. Until you disagree and they want you out. Does that make sense? It's an evil, mean, fake, and fatal presentation of belonging that's from your enemy. He wants to present to all of you this type of belonging that the world offers that you know as well as I do that all of it has stipulations that I just mentioned. Correct? But there's some good news in this, okay? There's some good news. Jesus offers true belonging. Only in Jesus will you find true belonging. A belonging that simply, it, 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 is, it is the two become one. Look, Jesus paid a price for you, but not so that you can be his belongings, so that you can belong. I'm going to step on this thing one day, and it's going to fall. You know, I'm just going to run right over the edge one of these days. They were getting too serious, I had to say. But look, um, he paid a price for you so that you could belong to him, so that you could be insepar inseparable from him. Look, when you belong to Jesus, the parts are indivisible from the whole. Does that make sense? I mean, look, I, this is an awful little illustration, I've, it, but, but try, to, try to show you what, what it means to belong when you belong to Jesus. You're his, Okay? There's nothing you can do. So this thing's right here. What is this? Paper. You guys got it. The first service must have been too cold. Because they all looked at me and I was like, it's not a trick question, y'all. It's paper. It's paper. This is paper. And look, no matter what you do, it's always going to be, right? But let's just say, for instance, that this half of this paper has this uh, distorted self-concept. And it says, you know what? I just don't want to be paper. I don't feel like paper. I don't want to be paper. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to separate myself. And this one ripped right down the middle. First, I was just a terrible rip. This one rips wonderful. So, and I just don't want to be paper. And so just goes ahead and just leaves the paper, you know, and decides to alter itself, right? I'm going to change the way I look. I'm going to change the way I feel. I'm going to change the way I, all this, I mean, feel. I'm going to change the way I look. If I took crayon and I or took a crayon or something and colored this thing or a paintbrush, it's still going to be what? If I take this and I put it in Zimbabwe, right, that far away from the, it is still what? Paper. No matter, when you are in Christ, you're always going to be in Christ. You're paper, right? Now, look, this is confusing for us to believe because we live in the world of fake belonging, don't we? You're sitting there struggling with that. There's no way. What about if I do this? What if this happens? What if that happens? No. When you are in Christ, you belong. You are always paper. And if you have, not if, since we all have decided with our distorted sinful view of self, decided that we don't want to be paper, and we ran around and we fell short of the glory of God, the only way to get back to paper is Jesus. It's the only way to belong. 
is through him. Look, he made you. He made you. He died for you. Don't ask anybody else what you're for and where you belong. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but this is, this is the, I, you don't ask anybody else who you belong to except the one who made you. If you want to ask an invention, I mean, if you find an invention and say, what is this thing for? I can't make any sense of it. What's the best way to find out what it's for? Ask the inventor. Ask the one who made it, right? Don't say, look at yourself and see if you can find where you belong inside you. And guys, listen, whatever you do, don't trust your own heart. Whatever you do, don't, please don't trust your own heart. Don't trust your own feelings, okay? Look, you, you should know that in your own life, you've been wrong, so, your feelings have been wrong so much that they should not be trusted, okay? And that everybody else around you has been wrong so much. This culture is so wrong all of the time. You know, they, they can prove it this day and then it's disproved the next. Do not go to the culture to find out where you belong and who you belong to. There's only one person who can tell you, and that's Jesus Christ. You were made by him. You were made for him. All things were made through him and by him and for him. All right? And that's where you're going to find out where you truly belong is Jesus. And here's, what, here's what's the beauty of this, guys is that when we believe in Jesus, we belong to Jesus. Now, here, look. You are loved and accepted and belong and held not by your behavior, not by your performance, but by his. That gives us all security and comfort, does it not? In all of the relationships that we have that are unfake belonging, and we know we gotta pretend, we gotta pretend, we gotta act this way, we gotta do what he says, we gotta do what she says, we gotta act like they act, we gotta be like they, or or if they're gonna not accept us. It's in Jesus that he says, My performance holds you. Don't fake it with me. Isn't it wonderful that we can stand in front of Jesus naked and not ashamed? Naked and we don't have to fake it. We stand in front of him and he says, I know who you are, boy. I know your thoughts. I know who you think you might be. But I love you that way. And I love you enough not to leave you that way. To make you in my image. Gosh, man. This preaches, don't it? You are held by him. His performance on the cross. His performance in being perfect. His behavior, right? You are held by his. That should give you such freedom and security to live your life. Man. The days knew this. The days knew this. They knew that they were among those, as Romans 1, 6 says, who were called to belong to Jesus Christ. They wrote, when they would write about being believers who belong, it was almost as if they didn't know how to word it. But they would put an article. They would say this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. There, or there is therefore now no, no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ, is that not a strange, those of you who have read your New Testament before and you read that, is that not strange? Has it not been strange to you? It's been strange to me over the years. I'm like, in Christ? What's that mean? Like, they're in? Yeah. Like they're in, what's, what's that look like? What's that mean? To be, and they didn't have the language for just being a part of him. They didn't have a, 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 the language for just belonging to him. You were in Christ. The two became one. You were so connected. You, your belief made you belong so much that you become one. Do you hear this, church? Hear this. Hear this. Your belief makes you belong so much that the two become one. I think I've read that somewhere, right? Look at this. In Acts chapter 9, there's this guy named Saul who hates the church, hates the gathering, hates the people, hates the days, wants to kill all of them. And he is going to kill them. And it says, but Saul, 
still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He's going to kill them, and he encounters Jesus, and it says, And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting them? Doesn't say that, does it? He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Put the two together, put the two together. They are me, and I am them. They are in me. You hurt them, you hurt me, boy. Right? Get this. You, are so, you belong to him so much that you are one. Jesus told his disciples this before he, before he um, died. He said, truly I say this to you as you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers. You what? You did it unto me. Look, when you believe in Jesus, you will always belong to him. He will keep you. His work will keep you. And they knew this. And here's what happens, guys. When we have this, look, when we are people that know that we have denied and we have doubted and we have deserted him, and yet he still comes to us and sits over there in that chair beside of us and says, boy, I love you. I love you. You go up there and you tell them about me, right? Or in your prayer in the morning, he sits down with you and he puts his arm around you. He says, just crawl up in my lap and be my little boy today. I know how you're hurting and I need you. Right, you're, But you know that you're someone who did all this. And when you have this type of belonging, this type of, man, he's never really going to leave me. You're never really going to leave me, are you? You're always going to be there with me, aren't you? You're always, I mean, there's nothing, right? He says, yes, yes. This ought to change us. This ought to change us. It should change the way we view when we belong it should change the way we view our lives and what we do with them. And that's what happens in Acts chapter 2. Back to the beginning here, Acts chapter 2. We see that these people who, because they believed that they belonged, they gathered, they grouped, and they gave. Because they knew that they belonged, they were called out to gather. They knew that they were called out to give. Let me give you the context for Acts chapter 2 that we read at the beginning. All the disciples devoted, or I mean, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, right? Right? And the breaking of bread. Here's the context for that. This is Pentecost. Okay? It was a prescribed celebration that everybody, if you were a Jew, you were supposed to come to this, no matter where you live. And we find out from Acts that people from all over had come to Pentecost. In fact, it says all nations. He, Luke lists some of them. He said that there were Parthenians, there were Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Persia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Caesar, Libya, Cyrene. I couldn't read that word, so I just threw Caesar in there. Visitors from Rome, proselytes and Jews, Cretans and Ara uh, Arabians, they were all there. So you get all these people from all over the world, and they're there. And we know what happens, that Peter preaches the gospel, and 3,000 of these people come to faith in Jesus, right? So what do they do? They stick around. Instead of going back home, they devote themselves to sit down to the apostles' teaching. Who's better to teach them? The apostles, the ones who were disciples. They're sitting around telling them stories like, look, this Jesus, he said one time, I am the bread of life. And we all thought, man, you got to prove that. You know, you say stuff like that, you're going to prove it. And then he tells some little kid with a lunchable to come up, and he feeds 5,000 people with a couple of loaves and fishes and proves that he was the bread of life. Sometime, one time he said, I am the light of the world. And everybody was like, you got to prove that one, dude. And he says, hey, blind guy, come here. He can see, right? One time he said, I am the resurrection and the life. No one comes to the Father except him, right? I mean, I, I, you know, if you believe in me, you'll never die. And we're like, you're going to have to prove that. And he walks over to a tomb and says, Lazarus, come forth. you got to do it that way, by the way. you got to do that. And then the dead guy walks out. And then to top it all, he says, kill me. And then three days later, I'll raise myself from the dead. And here he stood. <laughs> right? That's what, they, that's what they, and these guys wanted to hear these stories, these new believers. And they stuck around. And they didn't go home. So where were they going to stay? Hotel Jerusalem? There's no way for them to stay. People who say that this is the creation of some kind of commun communism in Christianity, are, they're not looking at this text the right way. 
The practical application here is these guys were sticking around, and they didn't have anywhere to stay. So they opened up their homes and said, you can stay with us while this is happening. You don't have any money. You don't have any food. We'll sell our stuff so that you can stick around. They gave so that these people could hear the gospel, and then they could go back to their countries. And this is why when the disciples go, and they go all over the world, they find out that there's believers everywhere because of this. So could our belief that we belong Alter the way we view our belongings. Right? It says here that, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any who had need. See, guys, belonging changes the way we view our belongings. It should, shouldn't it? When we believe we belong to something, we give to it, don't we? When we believe that we belong to something, we give to it. I, I, I play baseball. Coach baseball for years. Oh, we're over time now. I was like, first service, I was two minutes under. This might last till 1230. Um, anyway, um, coach baseball. And we had this play and play baseball called, uh, called a suicide squeeze. You may have heard of this. Suicide squeeze, you got a guy on third base, and you, you give a signal to, the, to the, the guy at the plate, and he bunts to get the guy home so you can score the run and win the game. When I was coaching one time, and I had a guy that was a really good ball player, and we had a guy on third, and I gave him the bunt signal. You know what he does? He hits a single over the shortstop's head. We win the game because the run comes in. Guess where he was next game? On the bench. He didn't have any of the back of his uniform left because I chewed him out. <laughs> why? This ain't about you, boy. The reason why I gave you the bunt signal was not because I didn't think you could do that. You had told me how much you're about the team the day before, and you proved it that you wouldn't. You would not give of yourself for the team. It's all about you. And that's why you're going to ride that pine until you figure it out. See, guys, when you belong to something, you give yourself to it. Hey, by the way, isn't this, what, isn't this what's meant for marriage? You belong to one another. You're not each other's belongings, right? You belong to one another. It's my money. This is my money over here. Your, no, there's no such thing as my money and your money. It's our money. There's no such thing as my body and your body. It's ours, right? belong to each other. My kids and your kids, they're our. That's what it was meant for marriage, that the two should become one. And it's a beautiful thing in marriage when you give yourself up for the other. I think I read that somewhere before too in Ephesians chapter 5. All right. Close with this thing, this little story. There was a guy who had observed Christian gatherings early on in church history. His name is Plenty the Younger. And he had watched these guys gather, and he was like, I wonder what that's about. So maybe he eavesdrops, or maybe he interviews one of them. We don't, you know, but here's what he says. He says, these people, the days, they meet on a certain day before light. And where they gather, they sing hymns to Christ as to God. If someone came in here today, and they looked at your singing, would they say, they sing like they're singing to God, that this Jesus is God to them? If someone were to look at your giving, would they say, he gives, like he believes that he belongs to God? Look at his giving. If someone were to come in here and hear you praying, would they say, he prays to him like he is God? I believe if we will, that our world will be turned upside down from this room. Not an impressive room, to be honest with you, right? Especially from this chair. But God can use you like he did these early days to turn the world upside down. If you're here this morning... And you came in here and you felt like you haven't belonged anywhere in your life. I've got good news for you. Go to Jesus. Stop asking everybody else on this planet. Stop looking inside your heart and start asking him. I'm, just look at him and be vulnerable. Isn't it beautiful to be vulnerable in front of him? You have to be vulnerable in front of him, right? 
You have to come to him and say, you know me, you're God. You know what I'm thinking. You know that I'm confused. You know that I'm scared. You know that I don't know. But I'm going to trust and believe that because of the resurrection, you're God. And you tell me where I belong. I believe he'll answer that prayer. Let's pray. Father, this room, it, um, it's gotten real quiet. And I believe deeply, Father, that it's because you're doing business with people in this room. You're speaking to somebody's heart and you're letting them know you belong to me. You don't belong to any of that other stuff. You stop believing that devil's lies. And you listen to my voice. You belong to me. Come to me. If you're one of those people in this room, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to slip your hand up right now. Just put your finger up, put your hand up in the room and say, look, I want to belong to Jesus. I give myself to him, vulnerable in front of him. If you're one of those people in this room, you know what? You may have belonged, but you've denied and you've doubted and you've deserted. I want you to do the same. Stick your hand up in this room and say, God, I believe I belong to you. Father, we praise your name. Make your name famous through this gathering. Send us out. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.